invite you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 9 this morning, Matthew 9. And this morning we're talking about something that I think should be of interest to all of us, because all of us should want what is offered here. And what is offered here is the, the example of how to grow as a Christian. Christian growth, growth. We should all want to grow. I think there was a time in my life when, as a little squirt, uh, all I wanted was to grow taller and to get bigger. I was a very small, tiny kid uh, all the way up through junior high. Uh, I used to wrestle the, the fly weight, there, you know, the lightest weight in seventh grade. And then when I went to eighth grade, I transferred schools and I wrestled three pounds lighter. They had a lighter <laughs> weight class. So I was the lightest kid out there. And so I was always trying to put on weight and muscle and height. And my brother, by contrast, he's six foot six, 230 pounds. So he was always taller than me. So I, you know, I just always wanted to get bigger. But as I uh, compare that to the Christian life, sometimes we grow stagnant in our desire to grow, especially when we get older. It, there become excuses to not grow anymore. Well, my clay has hardened. I've seen all the wars and battles, and so I'm done growing now. I don't need to learn. And nothing could be further from the truth for a Christian. We all need to grow and keep growing. I think the two reasons that we don't grow in our older age could be boiled down to pride or perhaps guilt, which also triggers pride. Uh, we think that we're beyond the need or reach of God's grace to grow at a certain stage in our life, and nothing could be further from the promises of God where he who began a good work in you is going to be faithful to complete it till the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're growing from one level of glory to the next. We need to be like the saints of old where the old men and the older women were still growing. Sarah was still growing to be pushed to understand that, yes, you can still conceive and have a child. Don't laugh at God. And for men, even like Moses, who had, who had um, forsaken the Lord's command at the end and was not permitted to go into the promised land, still in his old age was learning and growing, having, having to endure hard lessons even at the end of his life. We all need to grow. Uh, in the first hour, I shared something that is somewhat of an interesting thing. I got permission to share, that, share this, but between my wife and I, uh, Judy will regularly, especially these days, remind me of moments where I just haven't learned that lesson yet. And she'll look at me with a little bit of incredulous um, banter saying, I can't believe you don't know that yet or haven't learned that yet in marriage or life or anything at all. And I can't think of anything, but there's so many practical moments in my life where I just haven't learned to turn a wrench that way or do this or, or whatever, just fill in the blank. But it's amazing. My return to her is we're always growing. We're always learning. You know, it's never too late for even me to grow and to learn. And uh, that's how God smiles upon us. He, he brings circumstances into our lives that are hard. And life is hard and we know it is hard because of the fall and the sin that is in our lives and around us. And we need to grow to face the world that we live in. I was uh, looking at an old uh, article that um, I sort of lifted something out of an article that caught my attention. It was by a man named Vivek Wadha, and he was writing as an analyst from Stanford University on ageism, and he was combating or counteracting a, Sil a Silicon Valley a mantra where they were saying, we want to fund and hire entrepreneurs who have hardly um, come to a place where they can shave their face because we want innovators. We want youngsters that don't have history and baggage. So we need to bring them to the emerging technologies of social media. And this man wisely counteracted with the um, what this paragraph saying, employers and investors who believe that people are people stop being creative as they reach middle age are dead wrong. Think of Ben Franklin, been at the lightning rod at 44, discovered electricity at 46. Uh, he dr helped draft the Declaration of Independence at age 70, invented bifocals. Uh, later in life, Henry Ford introduced the Model T at 45. Sam Walton built Walmart in the mid 40s, and all the people in the South said amen. Ray Kroc, he built 
McDonald's in the early 50s and gave us all heart disease. No, just kidding. All right. Some of the most creative people were not young. Even, I mean, there's other ones, but uh, Steve Jobs, uh, you know, he did all of his iMac, iTunes, iPod, iPhone, iPad. All that came after age 45. It's just a metaphor. We need to be growing. First John talks about the children of God, those who are newborns, like First Peter says, infants longing for the pure milk of the word. Then you have young men who, who begin to understand the wiles of Satan. And they, they've overcome the evil one. They're, they're beginning to put on the armor of God. And then you have old men that know truth, that are grounded. We're brought forth by imperishable seed and we, we grow into being fathers of the faith. If we stand the test of time, there's those who are new and those who have weathered storms, those who like the caterpillar have pressed through the chrysalis and become the butterfly and we grow in grace. We work out our salvation in fear and trembling. It's always a combined effort, right? It's not just the trial that grows us and it is the spirit of God who is going to grow us even against our own wills at time, but at times, but there's also the discipline of train yourself in godliness, the, the two-sided coin of sanctification as we grow. And Jesus, let me remind you of this. He might be grieved with where you are spiritually. He might be grieved by your sins, but he loves you as a father. He loves you as a shepherd and he is your pastor. He is your pastor, pastoring you in a way that I could never pastor you, pastoring you on the inside by the Holy Spirit with God the Father, God the Son working in your life and the Holy Spirit refining and correcting things. Jesus was doing that and demonstrating that with his disciples whom he loved and walked with, where at points he would say, I would share more with you, but I know that you can't bear that at this point. And so he's bringing us along it to the point of where we can bear things and pushing us a little bit more and a little bit more as a good coach does to bring people to their best. The Gospel of Matthew is about needing a king. Jesus is king. He's sovereign over this world. He's sovereign over the government. He's sovereign over the politics. He's sovereign over the debates. He's sovereign over the division. He's sovereign over all the dynamics right now and the decisions we're making. But he's sovereign maybe even more especially of your life as a Christian. He's sovereign over you. He's sovereign over you. And so we're gonna see in this text how Jesus is sovereign over a couple different people who find themselves in dire circumstances, in need of their king, in need of their shepherd. They, they show us what it looks like to grow. Jesus, in the context of Matthew, has demonstrated how he's Lord over creation, hushing the violent storm, Lord of the demons, He's cast them out of the crowds. He's healed people of disease and sickness. And now this is a, an, a special note of how Jesus is Lord over death. Lord over death. The desperation of impending death is what Jesus is Lord over. Death is being talked of all the time, either directly or indirectly, all the time, on the media waves, in the conversations, everything related to vaccinations or not, everything related to COVID or not, everything related to people who are sick or not, everything related to all of it could be boiled down to the fact that we need to face, just stare face to face with the reality of death. Death. That's really the Boil it down. That's the issue people are really talking about. They're talking about a lot of stuff up here, but really they're, they're trying to grasp and grapple with facing death. Once you as a Christian, listen to this, come to the place where you no longer fear death. Death will always hurt. It will always sting. It will always grieve. It will always just profoundly alter your life when you lose someone in death. But it doesn't mean that we can't face it in faith and understand what's beyond death. And once you come to the place where you say, nothing can separate me from the love of God, not height nor depth, not depth, not anything, not death cannot separate me from God. I will see Jesus face to face. It's appointed unto man once to die, and then after that, the judgment, the wages of sin is death. We understand that there are reasons for death, but whether you are a stillborn who died and instantly came into the presence of the Lord or you're the multi-billionaire Steve Jobs who died, death is the ultimate leveler. 
And when there is no fear in death, we are free. You want to talk about fighting for freedom, that's freedom. No fear in death. No fear in death. We, we understand heaven. We understand Jesus is there. We're not wishing ourselves to die sooner than the Lord wants us to, but to live is Christ, listen to Paul, and to die is gain. He could only say that because he had looked squarely face to face at death and understood that Jesus is on the other side. Jesus is on the other side of that, and he's here in our lives. And once you understand this, it unlocks the key to growing as a Christian and age and sickness become lesser issues in your life because Jesus is the Lord over death. He's the Lord over, uh, in this section, a little girl who was on the brink of death and then Matthew says ultimately died. And then um, a woman who for 12 years suffering a blood discharge, a hemorrhaging for 12 years, she's dying this slow death. Death is what's at stake and Jesus is the only solution to each one of these scenarios. You have Jairus, and you have a woman, you have Jairus who lived and grew up this little girl for 12 years, one whom he obviously loved, a ruler in the synagogue, a known person amongst the religious elite with the scribes and Pharisees, but he loved his little daughter. All bets were off. His pretense was gone. He's gonna throw himself at Jesus in desperation on behalf of his little girl, 12 years old. It's the pivot point of age from, from being a child to going into maturity. Her whole life is in front of her and she has died. All he could do is throw himself upon Jesus and his mercy. And then you have the woman. Um, the man, the ruler named Jairus is known um, for being Jairus in Mark and um, Luke's gospel account. The woman is nameless. We don't know her. She's of no status in this culture. And because of her disease, especially isolated from the community, forbidden to worship in synagogue. She can go to no one to bear this burden with her. She's considered by the Levitical law to be unclean. To be in a menstrual cycle would mean that after that period for seven days, you're unclean. What if it never stops? You're always unclean. You can't touch anyone. You can't be with anyone. It's as if she had leprosy. And she was in a state of hopelessness. All she could do is throw herself upon the mercy of the Lord. But I want you to see in this section, you're gonna, the, the section begins with Jairus begging on behalf of his daughter. Then it goes to the focus on a woman who's, who's need, in need of healing. And then it goes back to Jairus and um, the daughter account. And this is somewhat of a sandwich story. But I want you to do this. Don't compare Jairus and the woman, even though they're the two prominent characters. The character that is most prominent in this text is the Lord Jesus. And so the title of my text is moving from being Jairus-like to Christ-like. We're all Jairus-like. We're all desperate believers in need of Christ. And Christ brings us to these points of desperation to take us from being where we are to where we need to be, to being like who we are, to being like Jesus Christ. So Jairus-like to being Christ-like. The two, uh, the need to grow in Christ are believers, both Jairus, this ruler, and this woman. Opposites, but the same. Opposites, socially, but the same in terms of their need. So, if you're taking notes from Jairus-like to Christ-like, point one, Christ will bring you to the point of desperation. How do you grow? Go to the point of desperation. Why am I at the point of desperation right now? Because Jesus wants you to grow. Jesus allows these things to happen. Jesus engages us and meets us right at the point of desperation. I have no idea as I look into your faces what you're going through, have been through, or what you will go through. But he brings us to the end of ourselves periodically, regularly, in ways that I can't understand, except for understanding that Jesus wants you to grow. He wants you to be more like him. This context here is one where it begins in verse 18. Um, it says, while he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him saying, my daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. 
stop there. Now, the immediate context is Jesus who's in the house, the house of Peter. He's eating with the tax collectors. He's eating with the sinners, the tax collectors like Matthew who had just been converted. Um, he's inviting, rather, let me edit that. It's, it's actually in Matthew's house. He's invited his fellow friends to come to his house. They'd earlier been in Peter's house in Capernaum. This is another house. This is Matthew's house. He's inviting tax collectors, the, the other people who were bilking the system, who were robbing people on the road to and from Damascus through Capernaum. He's saying, hey, come on, you know, you're all my friends. You're all part of this, this scheme. Um, let's all go to Jesus and get this right. And so Jesus welcomes them. But also, once Matthew is, um, is converted, it's opening the door for the dregs of society, those who were the outcasts, those who were the streetwalkers, those who were the partiers, those who were the antithesis of the religious elite. They're gathered in and Jesus is reclining with them, eating with them at table fellowship saying, saying, I'm all you need. I met with somebody this week and had an incredible gospel conversation with him. And he, he was heart to heart with me. And I was basically saying, brother, you need to come all the way to Christ so that he can have all of you. Give all of yourself to him and he will take all of you to himself. That's all that matters. It's just Jesus. And that's what Jesus is doing right at this moment when the crowds are coming back. They've sort of stood in judgment and Jesus he counteracted them by saying, look, I'm here to bring the new wine. I'm here to bring the whole patch of the gospel. No more of this legalism garbage. No more of this religious pretense. Let's just get down to it. Jesus is here. I'm here as the Messiah. And so the crowds are wanting him back. Uh, Matthew or Mark's account had said that he went over to the side of Gersa. And then when he came back, the crowds thronged around him. And that's where the scene picks up in Mark. In Luke's account, it's the same thing. The crowds are there. The crowds are back. It's the hoi polloi that's the backdrop of what is going on here. You'll cross-reference Mark 5, 21. He crossed again in the boat to the other side. A great crowd gathered about him. Luke 8, 40. Now when Jesus returned from healing the demoniac in Gersa, that would have been it. This is when the crowds are coming. So there's a throng of people, hundreds and hundreds, maybe a thousand or more around Jesus. He's out and about again. And it says a ruler came in and knelt before him. Verse 18. Behold, Look at this. This is distinct. It's a ruler who has said, I'm leaving my religious pretense. I'm, I'm dissing my robes. I'm, I'm just throwing myself down on my knees. Mark 5, 22, Jairus breaking through the crowd, just get out of my way and falling at Jesus' feet, kneeling before him. He didn't care anymore about his reputation whatsoever. He was all about his daughter brought to desperation. Mark calls this girl, little girl. It's a diminutive term, meaning my little girl, someone he loved. He's begging for her to be made whole. There's a discrepancy in the gospel accounts if you were to cross-reference between what Matthew says and Mark and Luke say. Um, in Matthew's account, it says, my daughter has just died, um, whereas Mark and Luke say that she's at the point of death. She's at the brink of death. In one sense, you just need to see it through the experience of Jairus, who when you traveled in that day by walking around, you're leaving perhaps for days. I mean, you're in Capernaum, so he might have been able to get back to her. But when you say goodbye to your daughter who is in a virtual coma at the end of her life, just as good as dead, you're basically saying goodbye forever, where he knows that Jesus is going to be her only hope, getting Jesus back to her. He, unlike the centurion, wasn't going to Jesus saying, if you just say the word where you are, she'll be healed, which would have been true. But he, where he was in his faith walk, needed to bring Jesus back to the house to his little daughter, to his little girl, his 12-year-old, his heart. He wanted her to be um, saved at the brink of death. And then perhaps in the final moments as he actually gets to Jesus, his servants are coming up, running up, giving him word, your daughter has died. Your daughter has died. And that's the discrepancy here. As good as dead, no, she's actually dead. My daughter has died. And these moments are ones that if you as a parent have ever had a child who was sick and in the NICU or in a children's hospital, you understand the desperation of looking at your child and feeling that, feeling helpless. I have. 
Um, I asked permission for this. This was the permission asking sermon. I have a couple of these this morning. I've already used one. I've got two more. Um, I asked Carson if I could share. He's got asthma and, and uh, you know, sometimes when the humidity kicks up, you see it again. He's got that, you know, weakness for breathing. But as a little baby, it was pronounced. He was little Carson then and we had to bring him to the hospital at times. He would get something like RSV and be laboring to breathe. And one time he was sitting on mom's lap and in the hospital room and he wasn't even in the ICU, but he's just sitting there and he stopped breathing and turned white. And at that moment, you're just, it's all up to Jesus. You're running to get people for help, right? But it's just, is the Lord going to preserve this little life at this time? We know that desperation, perhaps if you've needed or desired to get in with a loved one on bedside at a hospital, you understand that that desperation that this man was undergoing. Well, what happened? What happened? Well, he, with the empty hand of faith, came to the Lord Jesus. Verse 9 says, and Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples. So they're all going to go with him. They're all going to go with him. That brings us to point two. Point one, he meets us in our desperation. Point two, Christ will allow you to endure hard, humbling circumstances. And that's verses 20 and 21. He'll bring you to desperation and then he'll allow you to endure, that's a key word, endure, go through hard, humbling circumstances. This is a woman who's in real need. She's had a sad life of the last 20, or I'm sorry, 12 years. But I do want to bring this up. Uh, Some of the men who heard this sermon in a pre-sermon, pre-brief, they were saying, what do you think Jairus, what do you think Jairus was thinking? Here, he's got the Lord Jesus. He's on the way out of thousands. Jesus is going to focus on Jairus and say, yes, I'll go to your house and I will make a house call as the great physician. You finally got your doctor. You finally got through. You finally got your prescription. It's going to be filled. You're on the way and up. This person comes in the middle of that and stops everything. What is Jairus doing? Well, Really, the point isn't how Jairus is thinking, where he might have been saying, wait, lady, you need to wait in line. Um, Instead, it doesn't matter because the Lord Jesus is going to heal both. He's going to deal with both people. He's no respecter of persons. He's going to tend to this woman just as he's going to tend to this man's need and this little girl in this home. He is uh, the great physician. It's a great concept to see that he was willing to stop And it says in verse 20, and behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. A discharge of blood meaning hemorrhaging, weakening, and slowly um, killing the body. She was dying. She was a fighter. She wasn't just laying there in um, a state of victimization. Mark 5, 26 says that she suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but growing rather worse. It's amazing. She was rather growing worse, even though she spent all of her money. She went to all these physicians. Luke, who is a physician, a gospel writer and physician, Colossians 4, 14 says, um, speaks in Luke 8, 43. He says, She could not be healed by anyone. She was no better, but rather growing worse. Mark 5, 26. These are sad reports. Illnesses with this kind of pathology only um, could be handed over to therapies or coping mechanisms. There really wasn't a clear diagnosis, a clear pathology for something like this till the 1800s. I think today we look at our situation in our world and we say we don't have answers to certain maladies or medical um, needs and we're, we're panicking about that. But really we need to be in the same posture of this lady. We're wholly dependent upon the Lord Jesus. He knows our needs. He knows where we are. And we should be thankful that we were born into this age. But even 100 years from now, perhaps there'll be cures for things that we can't even imagine. We don't know. We just have to go with how God opens up our specific and particular circumstances. The woman suffered physically. She suffered financially. She was suffering religiously. Leviticus 15, 25, I kind of alluded to this before. Let me just read this verse. Unbelievable. This is the religious law that was over her life. 
If a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, not at the time of her menstrual impurity, or if she has a discharge beyond the time of her impurity, all the days of the discharge she shall continue in uncleanness, as in the days of her impurity she shall be unclean. This woman, her hemorrhaging never stopped. So she was always unclean, always disenfranchised from the people. The curse of this um, predicament is a picture of what sin does to our lives and keeping us, um, hindering us from holy relationships and connection with the Lord. But this just seemed to be beyond what you could bear. Another personal Crot story. These are the Crot's um, archives coming out, but um, this is another one. I, it's a personal thing with my wife that she said I could share, and so I will. But basically, uh, she, you know, we have six kids, and the blessings of that are, are profound and immeasurable. And many women go through um, different maladies like this, and perhaps you have lost a child in a miscarriage or a stillborn situation. And um, Judy underwent one miscarriage, and it was difficult for her. Um, early in her, her motherhood, and um, you know, she was sad for that, but it was also dangerous for her. It was not just emotionally difficult, it was dangerous for her because we had to take her to the hospital. She had lost a lot of blood, and um, she lost more blood than any of the doctors or nurses understood. A lot of clotting, a lot of blood loss, and, and so when she was going in for surgery um, through that process, um, they underestimated how much blood she had lost. And so when she was in post-op, laying in a back room with one nurse who was off to the side, kind of at a desk um, in charge of her, she began to, as the doctor later described to me, she was sinking when he found her. And so he had to take two, squeeze two big bags of plasma into her immediately to save her life. She was um, aware that she was sinking and was kind of floating away and she, she fought to come back, is what she would recount, saying, I'm not ready to leave my children yet. And the Lord brought her back, and, and so she's here. But um, these are desperate situations. These are dire circumstances to be, be in. And I'll say this. One thing she did say to the doctor um, when she was through it all was um, Job, Job's message where he said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's, that's, what, that's where you find your confidence. God is your strength um, through all of that, and it's difficult. And we don't understand all these things, but the point is you have to go to Jesus, and that's what she did. She made a plan to touch the fringe or the tassel of Jesus' garment. For she said to herself, look at verse 21, if I only touch his garment, I will be made well. I will be made well. She was undeterred. She believed in the healing power of Jesus. She was strong. This is a strong lady. She's gone to every doctor, every physician. She's emptied her bank account to try to be helped, to try to manage through. And she, everything came down to, I need to go to Jesus. I need to give all of myself to Jesus and Jesus for him to receive all of me. That's all of life, that's who we are. And the law said, catch this, that she wasn't allowed to touch people. And so how is she on the outside gonna get through this thousand person mob to get to Jesus without touching people? The law forbade it. I mean, have you ever tried to press through a crowd at a concert or a, hearing a public speaker or trying to get to your seat? It's near impossible but to touch people and say, excuse me. So she just decided, she made a very strong decision to get to Jesus even by stealth and to move in behind the scenes through the mass of people. The law forbade it, but I think she knew by faith, Jesus is the point of the law. He is the fulfillment of the law. The law isn't forbidding me to get to Jesus because the law is all about Jesus. And so I'm going to see my way through this moment because Jesus is here. He's the picture of the law, the fulfillment of the law. He's the ceremonial lamb of God, the, the shed blood that I, as the Messiah that is gonna be for me. The cross had not yet happened. So all she could do is go to the Messiah who was the lamb of God to take away her sins. And so she's moving towards Jesus as a believer, and she knows that he can heal her. 
No sin that she had done had caused her to be in this situation, but she needed to move towards Jesus for healing, and she was doing that. Just touch the fringe of the garment. Just get to Jesus. Just make the slightest connection with Jesus. Some people will say that's a weak, a weak faith to barely encounter Jesus at all, but really she knew that she, all she needed to do was get to Jesus. So I see this as great faith and growing faith like a good soldier. In the Marines, there are 11 principles that form the foundation of leadership in the Marine Corps to be technically and tactically proficient, to know yourself, to seek self-improvement, to set the example, ensure the task is understood, supervise and accomplish. These are a few of them. Here's the eighth one. Make sound and timely decisions. Rapidly estimate a situation and make a sound decision based on that estimation. Make no room for reluctance to make the decision or revise it. Just move in immediately. And I think there's a time and place for that, a boldness. We need to think through and consider the cost before we jump, but at the same time, eventually you have to jump. You have to go for it. If you believe it's the right thing to do, you, you move out, and that's what she did, and she was instantly healed. Mark 5, 29 says she did touch that hem of the garment. She was healed of her disease, Luke 8, 44, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. Everything just dried up. The disease, uh, metaphorically called in the original language, a whip or a scourge or an affliction was immediately gone. Her plan had worked and now she was free, but she thought it was over, but Jesus didn't think this was over. And I think that's key. She thought she's done. She had had a plan and guess what? Jesus had another plan. (laughs) She had a plan to be healed and Jesus now wanted to work with her soul. I think a lot of times when we go through circumstances and something seems like it should be over, we need to recognize that Jesus isn't finished with us yet. He's still working in our soul. He's still growing us by his grace. So that brings us to point three. Point three, Christ will cover all your guilt and shame. And that's verse 22. He meets us and brings us to the point of desperation. He allows us to endure hard and humbling circumstances and Christ covers all your guilt and shame. Verse 22, Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. Now, again, this is a summary statement. Mark's account, Luke's account say that she was immediately healed as she touched the garment. This is more of a summary declaration. Uh, It's peri blepo. Jesus feels the power leave him, and he turns around and spans the crowd and looks around and identifies this woman. Jesus is fully omniscient. He's fully aware of who, who this woman is, whom it is that touched him. He knows that. He's clarifying that moment within his omniscience to point her out. She wanted to move by stealth. She's an introvert. Jairus is an extrovert. Uh, She wanted just to get in and get out. Jairus wanted to take Jesus to his home. Both were dealing with a life and death circumstance, a life and death situation. Both were dealing with daughters, whereas one, one is a daughter in a home who has just died, and you have this woman who Jesus now says, you are my daughter. Take heart, my daughter. It's an amazing parallel, but all of these things are circumstances where we're supposed to be pointed to Jesus in growing and stretching. It says immediately she was healed. Luke 8, 45 and 6, fill this out in detail. It says, and Jesus said, who was it that touched me? When all denied it, oh, we didn't. Peter said, master, the crowd surround you and are pressing on you. But Jesus said, someone touched me for I perceive that power has gone out from me. Now, please do not misunderstand Jesus as a fully charged um, battery station where you, know, you plug your phone in and you're, you're made whole. That's not what's going on here. This is very personal and very intimate. That's why Jesus is identifying this woman. In, first, in the first place, he wants to identify her to say, I know that I have healed you. This is not something where it's superstitious. You touch the tassel and woo, I'm healed religiously. Or, you know, you do the religious thing or whatever, whatever to make yourself right with God. No, no. This was a woman going, I need Jesus. He needs all of me and I'm giving all of myself to him. And, and she's receiving healing. 
I've been unclean and I'm touching that which is clean and the power of God is healing me and it's profound. And Jesus is going, I'm aware of this. I am the healer and I have healed you. He's taking ownership for it publicly, but he's also wanting her, catch this, to take ownership for what she is doing and what she has received publicly. Very similarly to when people come into the waters of baptism up here and they either read their testimony or they say their testimony. And we love it when people do that because it's a public declaration of faith. It's one of the great clarifying moments as a Christian where you go, it's real because that testimony is my testimony. Whoever does that when you hear a baptism thing, you know, it's like, well, I went through this and I didn't know I became a Christian and then this was going in my life and this person entered in and oh, I'm a Christian or I, I, I claimed Christ at seven years old and then walked this bumpy road until this place, but I know I was a Christian here or there. I mean, you just resonate with people's experiences because we've all gone through this journey and that's what he wanted this woman to do, this ostracized woman, this woman who was put out of fellowship, put through an incredible endurance race, has met Jesus and found Jesus. And Jesus is saying, let's do this together. Let, let's, let's share your testimony together in front of everybody. I know you're an introvert. Jairus wouldn't have a problem with this, but you're gonna have a problem with this, but I'm gonna do it anyway. You thought you had a plan, I had another plan, and we're going public with this. That's what he's doing. It says in Mark 5, she came in fear and trembling. This is how she responds. And she falls down before him, just like Jairus did, on the knees, on the knees before the Lord. Jesus knew what, she knew what had happened to her, Mark 5. 533 says, it's one thing to know Jesus and believe in him. It's another thing to know with certainty that you have believed in the Lord Jesus and that he knows you personally. It's knowledge on the deepest level of certainty. And it says literally in that context of um, Matthew or Mark 5 that she was afraid, she was phobia, phobias is the word, she was fearful like the disciples in the boat when they were trembling because Jesus had calmed the water she was afraid, but it was a fear that was built in faith. She's trembling before the Lord who has healed her, who's changed her life. She's in, she's in humble shock before the Lord. Isn't that incredible? That's where we want to be. Listen to how Spurgeon describes this and applies this in church. Charles Spurgeon said, You perhaps, dear friend, have hoped to find salvation and keep it a secret. You entered the house of prayer, a stranger to the things of God, very anxious there. You sat and wept but you try to conceal your feelings from those who sat near you. You've gone in and out of the place of worship, seeking the Savior, but fearing to be suspected of doing so. Nobody spoke to you, or if anyone did, you evaded all the questions that were put to you, for you were as jealous of your secret as if you carried diamonds and were afraid of thieves. Mark 5.33 says that when Jesus identified her and she fell on her knees in fear that she began to tell him the whole truth. She began to open her heart fully to Jesus. Why? Look at verse 22. Jesus said in Matthew 9, 22, take heart, daughter, take heart. Your faith has made you well. He's saying that you're confirmed as a Christian. Take heart in that. You're a daughter. Isn't that incredible? This is one of the only times in Scripture, I think this is the only time in Scripture that Jesus referred to someone as daughter with this term. Take heart, daughter. Most often the Bible talks about being, you know, sons in the kingdom. This is one where it's like, you're, you're my daughter. In Isaiah 9, 6, you have the great... Um, you know, words that we sing at Christmas, you know, and it's about the Messiah. You are wonderful, counselor, mighty God, and then what? Everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. And you say, well, isn't Father reserved for God the Father? You have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Of course, God is our Father. That's the Christian name for God. But Jesus, as our, catch this, creator, takes a fatherly role in our lives. That's why he's called the everlasting father. He's the creator. He's the creator. He's saying, I created you and I have made you whole. 
I've lifted you out of isolation and let's now enjoy the public witness of the gospel together. It's incredible. This is what Jesus is doing. He's growing her faith. He's growing her faith. Mark 5, 34. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Go in peace. Be healed of your disease. Be healed. Next week, we're going to finish this off. I knew going in that I wasn't going to be able to finish. There's too much more material to go through, but we need to become like Christ and grow in our faith, just like Jairus and just like this woman.